this is session five of actual play and we're still on our first adventure which uh feels right for this group so we like to let things breathe that is a principle of this game so at a high level you are following or you have followed the path out through the great woods basically heading out to where Gorless the Trapper reported encountering some sort of runes, ruins hidden by some kind of illusionary magic. Caradoc the dog followed Gorlas's scent, and while no one was looking at Alex, they disappeared. Karina actually like helped Eilwen use the staff of the Lidless Eye. And where we ended was the eye showing both of you a tunnel of shifting, shimmering light with Alex standing at the end of it. So sorry. <laughs> I'm really not. Sharing a moment of being like, well, that sucked. I would like to threaten the rock. Yeah, this is all my fault. Okay, so before we get started, we have a beginning of session move. When you start a session, Karina, as the destined, Roll plus omens, which are currently plus zero because you reset after getting a hit last time. Got a nine. Okay. Well, On what a seven... if you burned bright and got a really good vision? <laughs> <laughs> well, hang tight. So on a 7 plus, the GM will describe a recent omen, dream, or vision that points you towards your fate. And on a 10 plus, you can ask the GM a follow-up question and get a clear, helpful answer. So tell you what. I will give you your vision, and if you decide that you want to, you can spend the two XP to burn bright and ask a follow-up question. Okay. Assuming you have enough XP to level up, which I'm kind of assuming you do. Oh yeah, I definitely have enough to level. <laughs> All right. So while you are holding on to the staff of the Lidless Eye with Hylwin, you know, you see that tunnel the way that I described, um, and you see Alex at the end of it. But you also get a very, like, snap, 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 really jump cutty type of flashes of, like, I don't know if Karina necessarily recognizes it, but it's the same visuals, like a lot of the same visuals that Eilwyn got when she saw the past, particularly of burning um, and these ruins burning. And it ends with that same basement that you've been having in your dreams lately that are filled with bones that are kind of scattered all about where the thing jumps at you. But this time, like in the quick jump, it's jumping at Alex. Don't feel like I need to ask a clarifying question as to the, <laughs> the suggestion inherent in this vision. So I'll keep my XP. All right. Alex, you were just sort of like walking around, right? Kind of trying to get Karadoc to follow the path and talking to him and you know with him. this good dog having a great time in the woods and as you were saying something like come on you know come on boy where'd he go it's like when you're wearing noise canceling headphones and you flip them on right like everything else just goes like mm. but it's full sensory like everything about the world around you just gets like shifted just a little bit and quieter and more subdued. Like the color just sort of like gets slightly sepia toned and you realize you're alone. Don't love this. <laughs> this is you, right? Mm -hmm. You realize that the area sort of in front of you is now different. There's clear stone buildings that have partially fallen apart like you can see little scorch marks in a couple of spots on them. There's rubble and they've all kind of fallen in. And there's, you know, thick growth all around it. You can kind of see a rubble field hinted at in the, the growth and the trees that are in there. It, it, you're very in tune to, to growing things, right? You know, you, you are a farmer. And a yeah, like Gorlis wasn't kidding. It feels two to three weeks further into spring, if not further. Everything here, like the trees are budding, the underbrush is like all sprouted up in green, 
as opposed to the like kind of brownish grayish crap that you've been wandering through for the last two days there's no bird song which is creepy as hell Mm. there's no wind but there is that seriously bright unfiltered light that makes you squint and just a pale green to absolutely everything what do you do I think for the first time in their life, Alex's old instincts and Alex's new instincts are in alignment. And like they reach for a weapon and they pull out of their pocket a bendis root that has then been dipped and dipped and dipped to form like a candle. Mm. And I think they like scanning their horizons to like keep an eye on things to make sure that they're not about to be, you know, like jumped at by a Crinwin or something. I think they like drop down on on one knee to like use the other knee as a little platform and pull out their tinderbox and start trying to light this candle. Okay, cool. That you know. happens without any particular hitch. Yeah, um, it's, it's not quick, right? Like, sure. but like, you know, 30 seconds later, they've like got the candle lit and now just feel in general a whole lot better. <laughs> they do like whisper a prayer to Helior as they light it. It is both Bendis Root and a holy light. Nice. I forget, do we, have we established, does it look any different when, when a light is holy? Not yet. All right. <laughs> when Alex finally, like, wakes up and realizes that they're, like, a living saint or whatever, like, maybe sure. maybe on that day it'll change. Like, <laughs> right now, ah, fucking no. Sure. And so I think, like, they're, like, kneeling down. I think they, like, take, like, a handful of dirt and, like, rub it between their fingers and feel it, like it's warmer than it should be, right? Like, I think they even taste a bit of it, to be honest. Like, they're one of those farmers. <laughs> they love to, like, wax lyrical about how, like, beautiful their dirt is. It's like chocolate or whatever. So something about the taste of the dirt, it is the earthy equivalent of biting into, like, the juiciest, most marbled steak you've ever had. Uh, this soil yeah. is, it is pitch black, like it just kind of crumbles. It's just like so full of life, which is weird for how still everything is around you. And so, yeah, I think Alex is going to like look around and I would like to discern some realities and figure out what the hell kind of alternate reality I have found myself in. <laughs> so you're just sort of like scanning the horizon. Yeah, like step one, right, is like, because like this is their faith, They look to the sky, like, where is the sun? Has the sun moved? Has the texture of the light changed? You know, are the the clouds different? And then they look to, like, all of the flow and effects of that. Like, what direction does the moss grow in? Is there really, like, no wind at all? They, like, lick their finger and, like, hold it. (laughs) Okay, cool. Go ahead and roll the certain realities. Cool. That is a nine- all right. Yeah, I really want those three questions, Jim. Okay. You got to burn bright. I'm burn bright. Like, you're going to get more XP. Yeah, exactly. Um, da, 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 da. I'm going to open with what here is not what it appears to be. Tell me what. Why don't we do this? Tell me what do you think is happening here? Uh, I think there probably is not a sun up there. I think there is just the impression, like an imitation of sunlight coming from an indistinct source. I imagine that, yes, indeed, there is no wind at all. I imagine that the moss is growing on every side of everything because the <laughs> light is like omnipresent in that way. I assume that this stone, the cut of it, the type of it, the like way that it is joined without mortar is like reminiscent of the, you know, what little maker ruin is left back at the village. I, Luke, the player, assume that, like, there is probably some kind of a fey thing going on here, but I don't know that Alex necessarily has the contact. Well, Alex has lived in the village for fucking 12 years at this point. Yeah, I think Alex thinks, like, this This sounds like some fucking fey shit, like, right? This looks <laughs> so most of that is spot on. There is a sun. The way that it's moving just feels off. Sort of in the way that, like, if you look at something through bad glass, it gets warped. Is it even as much of a thing of, as like, I like look up at the sky, I look away from the sky, I look back at the sky, and the sun seemed to have moved slightly, but like I could just be imagining it, but like... Something about the flow of time is absolutely off here. Yeah. The other thing that like is not what it appears to be, is you're kind of like looking about, you catch a sniff, even though there's no wind, 
you catch like a slight whiff of smoke, but not the kind of smoke that is coming from your candle or even from a campfire. It's, you know what? It's actually a, a smoke that you recognize entirely too well. It's it like burning towns? Yes. Yeah. And like, as you catch it, you kind of like look off to your left, actually maybe towards your right, towards one of like that kind of bigger building kind of directly to the north yeah. of you. And you could swear that you saw something or someone in there. But then like, as you look, no, no, no. It's just like a, a gnarled tree that looks like roughly that same size. But then like, really? But you were pretty sure. Uh, I don't like this. Tell you what, I want you to think about what your next question is going to be. While you think about that, I want to jump back to Island yeah, and Karina. All right, so you have your eyes closed, and Karina, you can't stop thinking about those flashes that sort of came to you unbidden. Mm -hmm. Karinok is whining near both of you, and you kind of see Alex at the end of that tunnel, like kneeling down and then standing up and taking a step further in and getting slightly smaller and slightly smaller. What do the two of you do? So Karina yeah. doesn't know what Iwan saw in that vision. So she probably doesn't have a ton of context for everything else that's going on. But that thing jumping out in the basement full of bones at Alex is like Kill Bill sirens in her head right now. <laughs> uh, and I think, her reaction because she has one reliable reaction and it's to get fucking pissed. So I feel like her immediate response is I have to get to Alex before something attacks them and I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that. I am kind of wondering if like anger is a gift applies here because we're not in battle, but she is pissed and she's scared. But I feel like the whole like mechanic of the move is set aside fear and doubt to do what must be done. Absolutely. Like Go ahead and mark the two um, resolve. But what do you do? I think she just says, I win. We have to get to Alex. Do you see anything that I didn't see about how we get through there? You saw the tunnel same as me, did you not? Have the two of you like opened your eyes? I think probably Karina opens her eyes. And then when she sees that the vision has disappeared, she quickly shuts them again. Okay. To like afraid that she's lost <laughs> it. And if when she does that, can she see Alex again? Yep. As long okay. as you keep your hand on the staff. Okay. Iolwyn, like, have you even opened your eyes yet? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Karina says, that tunnel disappears when I open my eyes. So don't. Do you think Just go. You're coming with me. Of course. I think literally what Karina probably does, because Iolwyn's probably still pretty shaky, right? Oh, yeah. I think Karina picks Iolwyn up. <laughs> I love it. And it's like... <laughs> I'm going to physically carry you so that you're not going to disappear. Um, fucking staff. All right. Yeah. She's oh. not thrilled about the staff, but there are more important things at the moment. Um, also carry Caradog. Oh, God. <laughs> you have to open your eyes to see where Caradog is. Very good. At the end of the last session, she had one arm around Caradog and one arm around Eilwyn, and oh, the arm funny. that was reaching around Eilwyn had also grabbed the staff. So that's she was right. like, I'm not letting any... Anybody else? Well, let's go. So you're holding Eilwyn like a child. Eilwyn's yes. holding onto the staff, and you kind of like mm -hmm. have Caradoc as a butt by the collar, and you're just sort of like oh. marching with your eyes closed. Like walking through this tunnel or trying. Okay. Eilwyn, while this is happening, is there anything that you would like to do or think about or whatever, like before Karina commits to stumbling through the tunnel? I mean, I've been picked up. Let's just go with it. Okay. You take a couple of steps towards it. Karina, you've got Eilwyn in one arm and Caradoc by the other. How do you stow your maul? Well, she might also have like a handmade like leather holster or something for it. Because when sure. she's hunting, she doesn't necessarily have the maul out. Sometimes she's got a crossbow or something. Yeah. She's I got to imagine that like... when you're going out hunting, like a maul is not the weapon of choice that you're freaking with. Oh, no. So I'm, what I'm picturing is you've basically got like the, the head of the maul like at your hip. Yeah. Uh, okay, the, the arm sticking back almost like a, a sword. It's awkward, but it gets the job done. Yeah, uh, helps to be built like a barn. Okay, so the two of you start stepping towards that or like lurching, I guess, towards that tunnel. 
because uh holy shit karina it is fucking weird to walk when your vision is coming from not your eyes but a foot and a half down and to the left quick jump back to the inside alex what is your second question jeremy you know i'm concerned about this ghost that i've just seen mm -hmm. uh, whatever the fuck it is so i'd like to ask who or what is really in control here mm. and is it ghosts no like who or what is really in control here is absolutely not ghosts it's all tied back to this glamour right that is sort of yeah. like containing the whole thing and i'm trying to think of like how you figure that out i have a thought hit me is there just like some like little piece of stone top folklore that's like when you're out in the wood like you feel a bit strange and you're like hey, hang on a minute is some fae bullshit going on here there's like a five step check your pockets check, you know there's like a process that you have to follow yeah, yeah you're exactly right and one of the things that you do is you check your pockets for iron yeah there's some little thing that you had, your tinder box. Normally there's a piece of iron in there that you use and you had to use like a piece of flint instead. Yeah. And uh, you're like, oh, that's weird. And it's just now occurring to you because it's that weird dream logic of like, oh, well, okay, that's not. Yeah, and then I think one of the other signs is probably that like very, very faintly you can taste like the aftertaste of honey. Mm, nice. But the other thing that occurs to you is whatever Gorlas encountered in here, you haven't encountered yet and you haven't felt it yet but it's probably here and whatever this glamour is it's not just keeping this place hidden it's also keeping that thing and the ghosts stuck here so that gives us a perfect jump back karina you're focused mostly on actually like keeping everyone going forward I'll win, particularly because it's taking time to like actually move forward and make progress. You notice that sort of like the weird light around that tunnel kind of forming the barrier and the, the veil basically that's hiding this thing that you're stepping through. It's like when you drop soap into oily water, it starts to like unravel around you as you take your first step into it. Oh, that's good. It's not a, oh, this is temporarily being suppressed type of thing. It's like an unweaving. It hasn't uh -huh. done that much damage yet. I'm going to absolutely point this out to Karina. Uh, I think Karina swears loudly. And she gives up trying to drag her dog. And like, this is not the most graceful thing she's ever done, but she grabs him by the scruff and just picks him up and starts like lurches forward, trying to go faster. Okay. <laughs> Eilwyn, do you do anything about this? Can I tell why? Because Hobbs the player has ideas, but I don't know if Eilwyn. Yeah, uh, I think what Karina thinks is happening is that the tunnel is about to come unraveled and she's got to get through it before that happens. I completely understand why you are doing what you are doing. I would like to know what Eilwyn is doing right now. So it sounds right. like you're trying to puzzle out what's happening. And why going... it's happening. Uh, why don't you go ahead and spell lore? That's plus int. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I got a 10 anyway, so that's uh, a lot. All right. So I owe you something interesting and useful. As you are, and, and especially like as Karina starts to like lurch forward a couple more steps, it, mm -hmm. it becomes more pronounced. And a couple of things occur to you. One, okay, this is clearly fairy stuff. You know that iron is supposed to be anathema to fairy stuff. You can tell that what is shredding this is the eye or more appropriately, the black iron of the eye's staff. That's just the interesting part. The useful right. part is you have a choice. If Karina keeps going forward, she will shred the glamour and it will be gone, meaning this place will fall back into reality. Or you can throw the staff down and you're in the tunnel at this point, you can press forward without the staff and leave the glamour intact. Okay, so I am well versed not in the Fae and their strange ways, but in the makers and the things below. This is neither of those. Point of fact, the staff, I would contend, is related to the things below. Uh, that's fair. You are welcome to ask a follow up question specifically about the staff and its role in this. If I drop the staff now, does it stay in this side of reality or does it go back to reality reality? 
if you dropped it right here, just like boom, like a little way into the tunnel, it would yeah. end up unraveling the glamour right around that area. And the bulk of the glamour would remain intact, but the staff would, you know, remain in reality. And that particular part of the glamour would have become weaker. So my real question for you is, what do you do right now? Now, yeah, I'm thinking. Would you like me to jump back to Alex? Yeah, go for it. Okay, Alex, you have a third question to ask. I'm really torn here, but I think I'm going to go with what here is useful or valuable. I think Gaulus has given us, you know, not a full picture, but like, you know, he's indicated what we might want to look out for. Yeah. Well, okay. Maybe you just like take a couple of steps to check out that ghost a little bit. And as you're kind of scanning around, and just to be clear, this whole area in here, like it's a lot of underbrush and there's a bunch of saplings, but we're talking like 10 to 15 year old saplings, not huge old growth trees like the ones that you came through. A fair amount of yew trees, too. You kind of register that there are what probably were actual nurseries of yew trees. Like, they're kind of planted in rows up this area, but they've just clearly gone unchecked for a number of years. They've gone feral. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that he mentioned that didn't make any sense when he was describing it was a statue, but not a statue. It was like a tree, like a statue. And you spot that here. And the other thing that he said was like a house made of logs that were woven together, but unfurled from itself, like a basket coming apart. And you spot that up here. The other thing that sort of jumps out at you is that all around here is where the growth is most thick and most lush. Yeah, okay, that, that feels both useful and potentially valuable. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. All right. So let's do a quick jump back to Eilwyn's instantaneous decision as she realizes what's happening. She's going to let it go, but she's going to apologize to it as she does. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there's a... And Karina, it takes a second to realize, like, you're not seeing through the staff's eyes anymore. And you kind of, like, flip your eyes open, and you still see, like, the end of this tunnel which okay. is weird, and Alex getting closer. Caradoc is being a bit more responsive now. Here, let me just grab the three of you and bring you and drop you in together. Yeah, in just a couple of moments, you step out into this, like, weird ruin that I was describing to Alex earlier with the strange light and the weird noise and a strange lightness at your hip. Karina has been around enough to have heard the rumors like the Fae don't like iron. And yeah. so when her mall all of a sudden goes missing, I think she's just like, son of a bitch. <laughs> um, Which, Alex, is how you know that they're there. The three of you, Karadoc included, emerge into this space to see Alex holding a candle that is burning surprisingly brightly in this weird washed out sun. It's hard to describe. Um, it's like smoking. That burns for like an hour, right? I mean, a candle burns for like an hour. I believe Bendis Root does as well. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, give or take. But yeah, you don't have forever with that as protection. So I think Alex takes like two like very quick steps with their big legs and like carries their like cloud of smoke with them. <laughs> I think they like lower their voice and they're like, we're inside some kind of a glamour or another. I found the fountain that Gaulus was talking about. It's not the only thing trapped in here, I don't think. I was just going to tell you to be on your guard. There's something here that wants us dead. Eilwyn, the Bendis root has a very powerful odor to it. Mm -hmm. But just mm -hmm. before Alex stepped up and you like got yourself covered in it, you caught a whiff of burning coming from kind of this direction. And then there was like a little, you thought you heard screaming but very quiet and far off. And then like, no, no, of course I didn't hear screaming. Uh, you know, like the smoke sort of just overwhelms your senses. <clears throat> Have I yet been put down? I don't think so, actually. And I think after a moment, Karina sort of like sets Karen off down and then she goes to put Alwyn down. And that's when she notices that Alwyn doesn't have staff anymore. And she says, where'd the staff go? What happened? Did you not hear me drop it? I was just trying to get us here. I must not have seen it. 
That's why the glamour's intact. Good decision. Whatever it was that Gaulus saw, I can't imagine that we want it roaming the Great Wood unchecked. I think Karina just sort of like meets Eilwyn's gaze for a long moment and gives her a nod and says, good call. Should we go examine this tablet? Yes. I lead the way. I know where we're going. Follow me. I know the way. All right. So as you are traipsing through this underbrush, Caradot, at first he is very like nervous, you know, like tail down, ears kind of back. But when Alex gets closer and particularly like once the Bendis route is kind of swirling around, Caradoc definitely like relaxes a little bit. I think Alex just like pauses for a moment. They like gesture with the candle and they say the wick of this is made from the root of a rare plant and perversions of nature. The things below and their ilk height the smell of the smoke. Stay close if you can. All right. You get a glimpse of what I was kind of describing earlier of a statue, but a tree. And as you get closer, three things definitely jump out at you. And not in a yeah, way, but like a, you know. You see the pool, and Karina and Alex, you recognize it as a decorative fountain. And the making of it is a little bit boggling. Like you can't quite puzzle out how it was made. Like as you get close to it, it's some sort of white marble, but it seems to be utterly seamless. Like you don't see the actual individual stones or the seams between them where they've actually made this. And absolutely it's overgrown and there's weird colored lichen and moss growing in strange patterns all over the place. But the marble itself is thick pieces, like that thick around the rim, no real seams and visible anywhere. You can only imagine what this looked like at the point where it was in, intact and maintained. And around it are four, are they statues? Are they trees? They're definitely living trees. They've got boughs growing out of them, but the shape of the bulk of the bow is like four separate statues, each of which are maybe six feet across, 15, 20 feet tall. And then like the boughs that are growing out are weird, like someone forgot to trim it, right? The figures themselves are pale wood, not yew tree, maybe like elder wood or something like that, but they are each shaped into a humanoid form I was going to ask. Eilwyn, it might just be because of the way it's gone feral and the boughs are sort of like growing out of the head, but it also seems like the shape of the head is very similar to the shape of the skull that you have hanging in your family's living room because you're a bunch of fucking weirdos. So the other thing is that this is kind of at a low point and these things up here are elevated. The ones on the left and on the right you see stumps of burnt timbers, but the timbers are, first of all, they're, they're thick, right? They're like two to three feet wide timbers, but they are twisted around each other like a basket. The edges are blackened. There's just huge chunks of it that have fallen off. And the main reason you can tell that that's what they used to be is because this one in the middle survived. It wasn't burnt down, but it unraveled somehow. You keep saying timbers. Do you mean like full-grown trees? I mean, just a little... yeah, it's basically like instead of being built with chopped wood, these buildings were woven out of living timber, sorry, out of living trees and woven vertically instead of laid one on top of each other, except that they're not like that anymore. You can just sort of barely see the hint of them having used to have been like that. They have rebelled. It seems more forceful even than that. Mm. And then the other thing that kind of catches your eye is you get a glimpse of a fairly large stone building off to this direction that seems to be more intact than the other ones. I don't know. I think, Karina, you maybe catch a glimpse of that one first. And tell me of the last time that you saw a home burn down. Probably the last time she saw a home burn was in Gordon's Delve. I feel like there's opportunity for things to catch fire there fairly mm. easily. Okay. 
Cool. And I'm going to just provide an extra detail. It was basically like a tenement that caught on fire because Gordon's Delve is built on the bones of an old maker fortress. And so there's just all of these like log house type things that are just strapped together as close as they can be in whatever space anyone can find. And yeah, you saw a fire happen. Probably four or five families got caught in and didn't make it out of. When you see this building, I don't know if it's the way that there's char marks around the stone that remains or what, but you definitely like get a flash of that. Karina just like sort of steps a little bit closer to Alex so that that Bendis root smoke, she gets a big old waft of it right in her face. You do recognize it as, okay, that's more than just a memory. If you want more information than that, that's going to be discerning reality. I think she just wants to know what the, if like, figure out if that's a vision or if it means something the way that some of her other visions have seemed to. Okay. So are you like stopping, cocking your head, looking around, that sort of thing? Correct. And what is discern realities plus? Well, I got a six. (laughs) I can't discern shit. Do you want to burn bright and get a seven? I feel like that makes sense when she's on such guard. Also, I still have a resolve. I don't know if that applies. There's no reason to spend them right now. All right. So I'm just going to burn bright. I guess that's in uh, seven. Okay. So what question would you like to ask? What should I be on the lookout for? Most sense for where Karina's head is at. Yeah. The flash that you got, when you kind of like stop and look back, you could swear that you saw people in that building trying to get out. And then like you kind of shake your head and it's not there anymore, but this was definitely not a memory. That's not fairy bullshit. That's some ghost shit. Got it, okay. And I'll give you this for free. When you step back into the aura of the Bendis route and like closer to Alex, it Mm -hmm. definitely clears. All right. I'd like to skirt slightly up. I'd like a clear line of sight to the non-statue parts of the fountain before we like... Get right up on it? Yeah. All right. You kind of like skirt to the north, get a clear view of the pool. And sure enough, it's a mucky morass of pond scum and weird lily vine type things crawling out. But sticking about two thirds of the way out of it in the middle is clearly the tablet that Gorlas saw. How Uh, big is it? About five feet by five feet, maybe like nine inches thick, but it's big, right? This is a large stone. Handling this thing out of the pool is not really an option. It will require some creativity. Eilwyn, when you see this, you're like, yep, just based off of what you see, this is a spell. Sweet. That's Uh what I'm here for. (laughs) That's where I'm going. Alex's hand goes out and like, it just like catches you. (laughs) And they're like, Eilwyn? Just to be clear, Eilwyn, are you allowing yourself to be stopped? Momentarily. Okay. (laughs) Eilwyn, you're the smart one. Humor me, solve this puzzle for me. Three people come up on a fountain. The fountain is full of water. Inside the fountain is something they need. There is no version of this where the good idea, having heard what Gorlis told us, is like, and then we go over there and like, we stand next to the fountain and like someone gives Eilwen a boost to read, like, you know, we need to get the thing out of the fountain to a safe distance. You said I could read some of it from here, right? Yeah. I got a notebook. I'm gonna start (laughs) writing. I'll get as much down as I can and then we'll, uh, we'll see what we got. Is there a version of this again where you write down two thirds of it from this distance and then we go right. in really quick, flip it around? Which it's like the grail tablet. You get most of the rubbing from the destroyed one and then you just finish it up on the... Is this maybe a spout law to see well, how much Isle One is able to get off the tablet from this oh, distance? Oh, here. Yeah. You know what? Go ahead oh. and roll spout lore because you are trying to figure out like exactly what this is, right? Eight, nine, ten. Just real quick, would you agree that this is something related to the makers and their hearts? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. Okay. Hey. So for the audience at home, uh, what we just dropped in here after much finagling is <laughs> the runes you can see are definitely enough to get that information, right? To like realize like, oh shit, that's what this is. That's what this does. 
but you can't, you know, figure out how to make the spell come together without getting access to the whole ruins. And you do definitely get to ask a follow-up question. Does it look like it will break? It does not look like it will break just by handling it. If you had, for example, a sledge, you could break it into smaller pieces with dedicated effort. But it doesn't look like just trying to get it out is inherently going to break it. Okay. I'm contemplating Fool of a Tooking it and, you know, dropping a rock in there. See how deep it is. Okay. So, Eilwing, you go up there. I'm going to go up there. Yeah. Okay. Alex and Karina, are you going with her or staying yes. back? This whole experiment is pointless if they're standing right next to the pool and there's a huge fog of Bendis root. Because then, mm-hmm. like, is there something in the pool? I don't know. There's fucking Bendis root everywhere. So I think they're, like, hanging, like, a little ways back. Right. Karina right. is next to Eilwen. Okay. Karina, am I right in assessing that you are, like, shield up at the ready to protect Eilwen in case something happens? Correct. All right. I'm going to ask you to roll defend. I've got a 10. Nice. Okay. You have four readiness. And I still have one resolve. You have two resolve. You haven't had to spend it for anything yet. Oh, all right. I'll win. You step up to the pond and what, you just like picking up a rock and dropping it in the water? I mean, I think if there's like a stick that I can pick up without Alex like freaking out about it, I like shove some of the pond scum aside so that I can see the rock as it falls in the water. Oh, you know what? The best place to get a stick is in this clearing area, like right up here. Yeah. I'll be right back. As you are uh, like getting to that, it's, you know, hasn't grown over quite as much as the rest of this area. Eilwen, when you look up there and see that- Oh, is this the building that I saw? the building that you saw like unravel. And the area that you are in right around, you know, here-ish. Oh, that's a good color. Yeah, this is a good color, right? Like there's a lot of burnt stuff in here. And in fact, you see uh, a couple bones, big ones in the mess how big at least cow big like if you want to like get in there and grab a big old femur or like a rib that that'd make a great staff i'm glad you could see where i was going with that yeah that's (laughs) that's in fact what i'd love to do karina i assume you're staying with her she probably keeps her eye out for anything she can essentially use as a club like a particularly sturdy piece of wood or another fucking femur um because she just feels better when she's got in her other hand that she can wall up an enemy with. I'll actually give you a choice. Sure. You can have basically a big old femur, or you find a hell of an antler rack. I'm just trying to figure out which one would make a better one-handed weapon, because the other one's got the shield. Oh, uh, no, I think you can, like, like grab on the antlers. But, like, either way, you're going to be dealing with something that's crude. Why the fuck not? All right, so Karina has big old antlers as a weapon. Yep. All right. Alex, when they head over there, are you staying put or are you going with them? I think what Alex is going to do is they are going to start quietly praying, just like under their breath. And it's like, you know, there's been some Lord of the Rings where people start speaking Elvish all of a sudden. You're like, what's going on? This feels magical. Like it's that, but in Legosi. Okay. Like, I don't, you know, this is not a prayer in the common tongue. I don't think we yeah. get a translation necessarily. I think it is the same litany that, like, Helior recites each night as she, like, passes, like, back into the underworld to be reborn in the morning. Okay. And yeah, I think they, like, want to stay in the same general vicinity as the other two. Gotcha. If this makes sense, Jeremy, I want them in the circle of the candlelight, if not in the circle of the smoke. Oh, actually, the, the smoke is reach. So like the spear length. So the smoke spreads yeah, the than, than the effect of the light. So in which case, I think I might reverse that. I think I, I keep them in the smoke. Okay. Are you invoking the sun god or? I don't think I am yet. Okay. I when you grab a femur. Karina has big old antlers. There's a moment though before Alex catches up and puts you back in the smoke where both of you, this feeling of being watched. 
it passes very quickly, but Karina, you find yourself thinking, oh, that's what a deer feels like. But yeah, then you get that whiff of Benda smoke and you're able to get the bone out just fine. As you pull it out, Eilwen, you're like, okay, that's bigger than I thought it was. It was like partially covered by uh, ash and debris and stuff. That's a good like four foot long femur. And like, all right, that'll that'll work. It's pretty heavy too, but you're able to move a bunch of the gunk aside. It like goes in with like a, about a foot left at the top before there's a clunk at the bottom. So about three-ish feet deep around the periphery. Nothing immediately jumps out at you. Can I see anything through the water? The water itself is full of sediment and and, uh, and mud. So you know, like, especially when you like move it at all, it just like swirls up and it's just, ugh. Now you have a bone covered in algae. I will mark that in my inventory. Okay. <laughs> I'm also very interested in this thing that Gorlis mentioned being in here. So I'm definitely like, yeah. I'm looking for that too, because I'm interested. All right. It sounds to me like you are discerning realities. A little bit. What'd you get? I got a seven. Okay. You get to ask a question. I my one question. What is about to happen? <laughs> I mean, that's the yep. question. Yeah, no, that's, uh, <laughs> so you are like moving, twirling the muck about, casting your eyes about, looking all around at this thing. And you ever been to the zoo and there's the crocodile oh. exhibit and you're like looking at it and you're going, where's the crocodile? And then you realize, oh, oh shit. I'm not going to reveal the thing because really all you're seeing right now is just, you know, the tip. But like, like right around there, there's something with a head the size of maybe two horse heads, probably, like based off of the sides of the nostrils, is just <laughs> sort of like in there lurking. There is something ancient and horrible and hateful and hungry, and it is staring at you. And what is about to happen is that the moment you let your guard down, the moment you make a slip, it's gonna break you and then come back and eat you later. You're getting to the point where rational thought is not an option. Karina, you have a resource you can spend if you would like to, because this is one of the things that Resolve is very good for. I think what she'd actually do is grab Eilwen and pull her back alongside her so that they're in the Bendis route again. If you want to do that without having to defy danger, I'm going to ask you to spend one of your resolve to put aside fear and doubt and act and do it more what's necessary. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll spend a resolve on that. That seems okay. like a good use of it. Eilwen, unless you actively want to resist that, her spending the resolve will get you back into the Bendis route and let your mind start to clear. I don't think that Island would be thinking clearly enough to really take much action on her own at this point. Okay. So yeah, you definitely like get back into the fumes. And I do want to point out, Alex, you've got less than half of this candle left. Island, do you point out what you saw? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's not a log, I swear. It, it takes the two of you a, a couple moments to see what she's talking about. The but then like, the oh. light thing, like, I think Alex lets out like a long, slow sigh. It is very much the same energy as the sigh they make in the morning when they know they have to go out into the field with Bastard. <laughs> and I think they like pass Eilwind the candle. Just like hold that for me. Like for a moment, I need my hands free kind of sense. And they just start like taking off like their big cloak. And like stripping down layers in the way that you do when you're about to like get wet doing physical labor. Gazass, and... baby, I got your candle. <laughs> <laughs>
Gazazz, <laughs> baby, I got your candle. And then I think they just like take the torch out of their pack, like light it in the flame of the candle, and then just like start walking out of the smoke forward, saying this prayer to Helior towards the pool. You've got the torch lit. You're yep. saying a prayer to Helior as you approach. Yep, invoking the sun god. Before you roll it, I want everyone to know what you're about to walk in on. Oh, cool. Is that one of those, like, if dinosaur artists rendered a hippo That's things? exactly what this is. That's uh, delightful, and I love it. Like, its body is low and long and sleek, and it's got the kind of, like, splayed-out arms that a hippo or that a, that a crocodile does. The other thing that I will throw in is that it's actual fangs that this thing has. They all are shot through with, like, a glowing red crystal. So you are approaching, you are invoking the sun god as you go, but almost as soon as you get out of the whiff of the Bendis root, really when you're about like here, you start to get that deer in the headlights, adrenaline starting to pump, you're starting to stammer, you're feeling your hands start to shake. And I want to know what you're doing about that, because every fiber of your being is telling you to run or to just freeze and maybe it won't see you. Like, this is the environment in which they thrive. And so I think what they do about it is they just lean into it. Like, the adrenaline glands start to go, and they're like, oh, cool, like, it's time to fight now? Like, yeah, I can do that. I'm not 100% comfortable just saying that Alex is immune to fear. Oh, no, 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 I know, absolutely. Like, I think there is probably a defy danger here. I think okay. what the defy danger looks like is, like, fear is the mind killer, right? Like, Perfect. Alex... Okay, I got you. Alex is not afraid of being afraid. They welcome it. it. I, I agree with you. I think that this is defying danger. Yep. It's probably with Wiz. That sounds right. All right, let's do this. Like, honestly, I would allow you to go with Khan, but I know that's not what you want to use. Ooh, that's not great. <laughs> What'd you get? A four. Well, mm. on the plus side, you get to mark XP. On the plus side, <laughs> you get to mark XP. So I think the problem is, is that like you are used to the feeling of adrenaline, the feeling of like, okay, here comes violence, here it comes. But it's been so long since you've been the victim. I'm like, like oh, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, yep, yeah. Yep. And, and like, Karina, you have been through enough shit to sort of like recognize someone freezing up. And like, as Alex stutters and freezes, right at that moment, the water just churns and this horror from ages past rears out and starts lurching towards them. You have readiness still, right? Yep. I am fine with you spending some to get close to actually defend Alex will require leaving the Bendis cloud. So I think that this is going to be draw all attention from your ward to yourself. What's this look like? Running forward, shouting, like insulting the thing, like, hey, motherfucker, look over here. <laughs> and then smashing the antlers against her bronze shield. She does that big gong move, like, okay. hey, asshole, look over here. Um, and she runs out of the Bendis route so that its thrall can affect her now, or at least its attention will, will turn towards her and she's not, because she doesn't make a very good distraction if she's still protected. You're basically like rushing out, getting in front of Alex. Bang, 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 bang. I think she actually comes at this beast from the side. Like she's trying oh, to startle it, distract it, to draw its attention. Okay. Um, to piss it off enough that it kind of like whips its head around towards her instead of attacking Alex. So the good news is you absolutely have gotten its attention. <laughs> the bad news is... The bad news is the same thing. There's a 2,000 pound mass of sinew and muscle and fang and hatred bearing down at you. And I just want to be very clear. This is the sort of thing that crushes bones, like if it clamps down on you. You got its attention and it's like... <laughs> it's coming at you. What do okay. you do? And keep in mind, you can, like, as long as you stay in a more or less defensive position, you can still fight back and hold the readiness to spend on whatever happens. 
Okay, I'm going to use my other resolve to act suddenly catching them off guard. So until the last possible moment to dodge out of the way. Yeah, I think I'm going to try to do the thing where she sort of like throws the antlers at it and then kind of like swivels out of the way so that it is rushing forward. All it gets are the antlers being thrown directly into its mouth and she dodges out of the way. Honestly, if you're going to spend a resolve on it, I'm fine with you just doing that. Okay. Um, So we will, I think, handle that with you dealing your damage. Sweet, it's a five. And your shield's in your left arm, right? Correct. Yeah, the way to make this work would be dodging to the left and like it past you like that. Yeah. And you did five damage. So... How much of its armor is in its mouth? Well, so here's the horrifying thing. So you dodge to the side, the antlers go in, and it like <laughs> crunches down on them. It's howling and like, <laughs> but you're, you know, kind of hoping to see like spouts of blood go flying all over the place. And it's just like, oh gosh, it's like just chewing on, it's definitely like in pain, but mm-hmm. you're not like seeing gouts of blood fly out the way that you might expect. Absolutely. Um, um, Eilwen, while this is happening, you're standing there with a candle of purifying smoke. Definitely a bit of like, ah, at all of this, but what you, you know, you got a good head on your shoulders. What do you do? They got it out of the pool. I want to see what I can get out of the tablet. I mean, I can't really <laughs> help fight the thing. So I'm going to take advantage of it being distracted. I want to get the rest of this tablet down. All right, so you're like running into the water? Yep, sorry, dog. I do wonder, Karina, what do you want Karadoc to be doing right now? She's like, leave it, stick, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but she, she, does, she does not tell him to come or attack. I'm good with that. So he's just sitting there barking. Eilwen is clamoring into the pool. Alex, now that this thing's attention is off of you, your nerve starts to come back and you start to like get a hold of yourself. And I think, like, as Eilwen runs past, I catch, like, a lung full of the Bendis root smoke. <laughs> sure. Karina is on the other side of it. It is <sighs> chomping on something sharp and awful in its mouth. You have a torch in your hand. Eilwen just ran past you. The dog is barking. You've got a moment to act. What do you do? I think they see that Karina has both, like, endangered herself for them and, like, is doing a very heroic and impressive thing and also like is now in terrible danger from this thing. Mm -hmm. And I think for the first time in 12 years, Alex gets angry, like really angry, in their bones angry. And I think they just like close their eyes and they're like, like they don't pray. There is no traditional prayer here. There is no litany of known words. They just close their eyes for a moment and they say, Daybringer, guide my hand, keep her safe. And then I'm going to invoke the sun god as they like step forward and just like press the fucking burning head of the torch like into this thing's flank. Nice. And the like holy light like erupts, hopefully, if all goes well. (laughs) (laughs) Roll it. I'm going to invoke the sun god. That is a seven. That's good enough. I am going to pick, I think the effort taxes you. Uh, Marketability. Like I just think like yeah. This has been a fucking hell of an experience. Like Alex is not feeling great. You know, they fell over slightly. I think they're going to mark weakened. Okay. I think I'm going to go with the last one. You must bask in sunlight for an hour or so before using the invocation yeah. again. This is Hold Back the Darkness, I assume? This is Hold Back the Darkness, yeah. All right. So tell us what this looks like light-wise. Like, does it actually change appearance? Yeah, I think it does. I think this is like the first like bona fide, like, oh shit, a supernatural thing is explicitly happening on screen with Alex as its source that we see. Yeah, I think the color and like texture of the light changes to like that kind of like rose bloody like sunset light that you see out on the like cliffs of Lagos looking out over the sea at sunset. And I think like the torch, the flame of the torch doesn't look really much like a flame anymore. It looks like there is like a miniature sun on the end of this torch. Nice. Eilwyn, are you a creature of darkness? Not yet. Okay, just making sure. 
Wait you know, until we have some uh, consequences. Yeah, yeah. Once we get a consequence or two. Well, and if I had the staff, I might be answering differently. Mm -hmm. ah, fair enough. Okay, so dramatic reveal moment. The thing howls and whimpers a little bit. And between the Bendis smoke behind it, the holy light that is repelling it, it is like, and trying to like, like get away from this direction. But Karina, you are in its way. It is trying to like flail and move in your direction and like go north. What do Let's you go back do? to its house. I was wondering if she had time to glance around and see if there was anything else that she could grab off the ground to replace the weapon that she just threw in its mouth. That'd be discerning realities in the um, middle of the fight. If you roll a miss, you're going to get clobbered by this thing. Okay, you know what? I changed my mind. I think what she actually does is just try to put some distance between herself and this thing so that while it's flailing around, it doesn't flail directly into her. And she has better maneuvering if it comes at her again. All right, cool. So in that case, if you were just kind of like backing away from it, so it basically and like rushes past you. Like a three-point turn. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of thinking about it, I, I don't really think that you were in any particular danger. Like, I think you could get away, unless your goal is to engage it and contain it. If you just want to let it go, that's fine. Oh, no. If it's running the fuck away, she's content to let it run the fuck away. All right. So it, like, rushes past to, like, here, and it gets to, like, this bone area and turns back and starts snarling at the two of you. Alex, I'm kind of guessing you're closing in after it. Yes, or... but only so far as, like, Eilwyn's got the Bendis route, so I don't have to stay, like, perfectly close to her, but, like, I want to keep, like, relatively close. Okay. So, like, this will kind of keep both of them in range. Now Karina calls Karadok over. Okay. <laughs> he is bark, 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 barking at this thing. Very good um, dog. Okay, Eilwyn... You have a Bendis root candle and a bunch of water in front of you and a stone. Are you like going after the stone? What are you doing? No, I'm going after the stone. Okay. So like blue, 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 blue. The first, oh God, it's gross, right? Like I'm sure it is. So you get to this massive stone that is almost as wide across as you are. What do you do? I am going to try and scribble down what I could not see before as fast as I goddamn can. Because mm -hmm. as soon as I have everything from this tablet, as far as I'm concerned, I have everything I came here for and we can leave. Not being in the same reality as that thing seems like a fantastic idea at this point. <laughs> okay, so that's definitely going to take time um, I'm sure and it is. both hands. What are you mm -hmm. doing with the Bendis root? It is a candle. Is it squishy enough of beeswax that I could just like smash it to the tablet and have it kind of burn onto the tablet? Yeah, do the classic like tip it, get some liquid wax down there and then just like- Yeah, like stick it to in. the tablet and have it just kind of- It seems legit. Okay, so that frees your hands up. So now the problem that you've got is you need to both clean off some of the gunk and there's a chunk of it that's still underwater. I mean, how much of it can I just like scrape off with my hands? You can get a decent amount of it off, but I think you're gonna need something to scrape with. I've got two undefined small items. Oh, and you've got supplies. So there's all sorts of stuff that you could grab. So long as it isn't made of metal. Right. Iron. Why not a comb? She's that's... got really long hair. Oh, that's a good point. I like it. Why is the comb special? Merg carved it for me. Oh, Merg. Hmm. Merg found some deadfall and was adorable and carved me a, carved me a little comb. Oh, Merg. So I think trying to get this like cleaned off in a rush with a comb, standing in hip deep oh, sure, water, yeah. like I think you're definitely defying danger. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think this probably is Dex because it's about precision. Oh boy. What is my dex? Zero. Okay, cool. I would like to aid. How? You're fighting uh, a thing. You are by... making it possible. 
<laughs> might be able to aid. I do want to jump a... back to the two of you, like while Island yeah. is getting there, getting a comb out, starting to scrape away before we even get to a roll. I would like to know, like Alex and Karina, the thing is like snarling and half pacing, half slithering back and forth. Gross. Um, and, and it's just like, ah, it clearly doesn't want to get any closer, but it also clearly hates you and wants to make you afraid and broken and then a meal. How long do you think that torch is going to keep it off us? And then they look at the torch and like how far it's burnt down and they're like, ah, we got like another 40 minutes. I think now is when Karina calls back to Eilwyn. How much time do you need? As much as you can give me. I think the next time it like tests the edge of the light, Alex just like quirks an eyebrow and like takes a half, like does the like half step forward, like, ah, ah. you know, we don't want to get in, we don't want to get in uppity. It backs off. Eilwyn, you are scraping away. Karina, are you going to go in and help? So yeah, Karina does, like she looks at Alex and says, I'm going to go see if I can help Eilwyn get done faster. I mean, if there's still gunk to be cleaned off the part that's not above water, then she can do that. But if I'm just like feeling out the carved runes under the water, there's really not anything anyone else can do right now. Bring the underwater part above water? Dip it. This is not going to be like huge stakes, but I do still want to get a defy danger from you of, you know, scraping everything off, cleaning everything off, etc. Sure. Go ahead and roll that. Ten. Nice. Yeah, Karina, by the time you've like gotten yourself over there, Eilwyn has scraped the majority of that off. Actually, I think it's probably at the point where she's like getting her notebook out and like writing everything down. But yeah, there's still like a good third of it that is underwater. If you're going to try and haul it out of the water, I think that is... Yeah, there is a danger of it breaking or you hurting yourself, you know, all of that stuff. So I think a defy danger with strength is in order there. I got a 10. Everything's coming up PCs at this point. Yeah, um, it takes time, right? You know, you have to rock it back and forth and then and eventually get it up. There's a bunch more gunk and I'll win, like you take some time like scraping it off. With Karina's help, you can get the gunk off pretty quickly. And you're glad you did because like, holy cow, the runes that are like making this part up, you're like, I have not seen some of these. It's not what you would have necessarily expected from what was visible above. So yeah, the next 20 minutes or so are spent like cleaning the gunk and copying runes down and Alex dancing with a giant creature of eternal hate and savagery. Strange what you can get used to. Aside from copying things down, Eilwyn, is there anything that you wanted to do here? Is there anything else about the tablet that's remarkable aside from the fact that it's got this delightful stuff on it? Yeah, you know what? If you would like, you can spout lore about this and possibly glean a couple more insights. I got an 11. Nice! Okay. The interesting thing, this is someone's thesis. It was submitted. And, like, it's clearly something that is a mark of distinction that, like, they created this. They made this. And they received recognition from their peers for it. The useful thing, you get two names off of this. The creator of this is Tikomar, T-I-K-O-M-A-R. And the plaque itself was carved by someone named Yevena, Y-E-V-E-N-A, as a congratulations on your magnum opus. Cool. And then you do get a follow-up question. Where have I heard the name Yavenna before? Did we ever get a backstory on the skeleton in your family's living room? Nope. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. What about all of this leads you to realize that that is the name of the skull that is in your uh, family's living room? Oh, shit. So... Part of how Yavenna has made their mark on this tablet, basically their artist's signature or whatever, 
is also at the base of the skull. It's a mark that is separate from the actual name itself. It's like one of those... Um, like a chop. Yeah, a chop. On the tablet, there's enough space that they put both their name and their chop, but the uh, skull was just that icon. And she's been fascinated with it for years because it's, you know, it's on the wall and it's cool. Can I throw a, like a, a, a detail like to come? Mm. Um, it's not like at the base of the plaque. It's actually like organically, like almost like wormwood carvings in the skull itself. Yes. All right. Cool. Karina, you sort of like probably, I don't know, soft gasp from Eilwyn or something as uh, as she figures this out. Karina takes this as a cue to stop holding up the tablet and tilt it back up into its normal position because <laughs> she's getting kind of tired. All right. It sinks back under the water. So... I, I, I was like planning on just sort of like nudging us out of here because I think you guys have got what you've come for. You have, sure. you know, like got yourself into a decent position. You've still got a little bit of time left in the torch. I want to ask each of you to give me one detail, or like kind of one, throw in one little vignette thing of what your flight from this place ends up looking like. Whoever would like to go first. Go first. I feel like Alwyn literally goes first. Like as soon as she's done copying runes, like we don't have anything else to do here. Uh, book snaps closed. Everything goes back in the pouch and we're gone. Um, she's just going to run. Because she's Do done with being, she's yeah. done with being carried. She wants out under her own power right now. Do you take the Bendis route with you? No. <laughs> it's stuck to the tablet and it's probably burned out by now. Uh, I suppose, especially if it got tipped underwater. All right. Karina or Alex? I think if Eilwyn just fucking takes off, Karina will be like, wait a fucking second or you'll get lost. Like, and then if Eilwyn doesn't really like respond or slow down, she yells at Caradoc to like follow her. <laughs> but then she says, Alex, let's go. I think the vignette of Alex we get is like, is like right, right at the end of our flight, right? Like at the other end of the Fey Vale. Where like we're finally like in at least in theory, right? Like we're safe. The thing is in its prison. We are not in the prison. We're all good. Uh the like the light like fades out of the torch and it's just a uh, like normal torch again. And the like the the faint glow fades out of Alex's eyes, and they're just Alex again. And I think we see now that they're not weirdly lit, how like like they are like deeply like pale, drawn, exhausted looking. Mm -hmm. There's like bags under their eyes. They're like fucking drip, like drenched with sweat. And I think they just like basically collapse. Um, uh, as as Alwyn stumbles out of that tunnel and grabs the staff that's hopefully still waiting on the ground for her, fingers crossed. Um, I want her to get a glimpse of the tunnel again and whether it's still intact or whether that damage was permanent it's damaged it is not torn okay. right like it's not it's the not veil is thin yeah the veil is thin i think um karina might actually bring up the rear on this because you think that she can kind of tell that alex is wearing thin and she still has that vision in her mind of that thing lunging out of the darkness to attack Alex, and she's not going to give it a fucking opportunity to do so just as they're leaving. I think you see, uh, like, as you leave, mm -hmm. there are these two buildings where you caught that smoke smell, and, and originally um, 
where Alex saw the first ghost. And like, as you are, you know, backing out through the tunnel, you catch a glimpse of like two terrified looking people made of smoke and like glimmering with light, like they're almost lit with flames that are just looking like, like absolutely terrified and horrified and like, like something terrible is happening to them. And then like the thing turns and just like, now like goes rushing into that house at them. And then that's when the veil like kind of closes behind you. That was fucking cursed. Yeah. <laughs> what time is it? That? that is an excellent question. It is dusk when you guys yeah. come out. So we spent um, like an hour in there. We lost a whole day. Pretty much, yeah. Right. Um, and for the record, just, you know, my notes are basically each time they eat something or pick something up and take it with them or make a lasting change upon the place that each of those like would contribute to the time dilation. Yeah. And you only really did one thing, which was to like move the, the stone around. And even that you put it back into position. We got off lightly. Yep, the femur and the antlers didn't do anything. Uh, oh. I hate to ask, like I'm that kid who's like, weren't we gonna have a pop quiz today? But <laughs> The femur is not a big deal. Um, the antlers, yeah, you know, I think I'm still gonna keep it as is because you did okay. put the tablet back and I think we will start the next session with you guys getting back to the village or possibly with a love letter if I have the time and the energy to put them together. We'll see.